Good, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Owen Kosisikutla, and I am here with Eileen Olmez, and we will be the moderators for today. Firstly, we would like to remind each and everyone to make sure that you do mute your mics. And this um, speaker series will be recorded and you will be given access to the recording soon enough. And also you may use the chat setting here on Zoom to give us any comments and questions. But before we continue, I would like to say an extra, extra wonderful good evening to all the wonderful women in the room. You are loved, you are special and you are amazing. And on that note, I would like to hand over to Women's Week. Intersectional feminism, a term first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, an American law professor in 1989, who explained intersectional feminism as a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. Intersectional feminism is feminism that recognizes that a woman can face discrimination differently based on the different parts of her identity, such as class, race, religion, sexuality, complexion, and the list goes on. These layers of one's identity subject women to overlapping and unique experiences of discrimination and vulnerability in society. Here's a list of statistics. One in four women has experienced severe physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner. However, a dependent, low-income earning woman is significantly stay with a potentially dangerous man for the provision of a basic needs. It's not as easy as leave him this, you're better off without him anyway, as being disadvantaged from education leaves him with almost nowhere to start. So although women in general are vulnerable to domestic violence based on their agenda, but the uneducated, low-income earning woman is in much more danger based on both her gender and social economy class. In the United States, the average black woman is paid 38% less than the white man and 21% less than the white woman. And although women in general experience the pay gap based on their gender, but black women are much more disadvantaged based on both their gender and race. In the United States again, the Muslim community is often harassed and associated with terrorist attacks, especially after the 9 11 but on top of that, Muslim women are constantly being denied the right to express their religious beliefs through the wearing of their hijab in workplaces and have been fired from their jobs for refusing to remove it. So in addition to the already existing pay gap between men and women and Islamophobia, Muslim women are additionally subjected to humiliation based on their religion. So if you are not a woman, you are less likely to experience domestic violence. And if you are a woman, but in the high income earning bracket, or at least educated and independent enough to fend for yourself, you are less likely to stay in an abusive relationship. If you are a woman, you will experience the pay gap between men and women, but not as much as the black woman does. And if you're not a Muslim woman, you'll never get to experience the humiliation of being forced to remove your hijab or being fired for refusing to do so. This is what intersectional feminism is, a movement to bring awareness to the issues that are unique to specific groups of women, solely based on their gender, social economy, class, race, or religion, which intertwine to subject them to discrimination that you may never get to experience. It's a movement that hopes that from this realization, we will become aware of our privileges, sympathize with others, and advocate for each other's rights. Feminism has brought us this far, but the future is intersectional. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I will now hand over to Eileen. First of all, thank you to Women's Week for that amazing presentation. And good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Eileen Olmez in ID1, and I'll be introducing two of our speakers today. 
So first of all, I'll be introducing Olawunmi Ola Busari, who graduated from WK in 2009 and is committed to using her strengths, love and courage in service of freeing others and herself from the limitations of poverty, inequality and outdated restrictions on imagination. As a global development professional, she is passionate about improving public sector performance and increasing the economic and political participation of vulnerable populations in, populations in developing countries. She currently consults for the World Bank's Social Protection and Jobs Unit, helping to inform the design of cash transfer programs. Olawuni began her global development career as a policy associate for the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab for Africa and has previously consulted for the World Bank's fiscal policy and um, sustainably growth unit, its governance global practice and two rabbits and education NGO in Cameroon. She holds a Master of Science in Global Human Development from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and a bachelor's degree in economics from Bard College. The next speaker I'll be introducing is Daniele Felicia Sabete Villegatti. Daniele graduated from Water the Camp Laba in 2002. She continued to pursue her BA in psychology and sociology at UNISA, as well as certificates certificate in civic leadership, child development, and so psychology of mentorship from various institutions. She currently serves as the national director at Women and Law in Southern Africa, Eswatini. She is also the founder at Women's Working Together. Zaneda's key career moments revolve around civic leadership and steering the ship of a small but big organization. Thank you. And I will be introducing Dimpo Radebe, a PhD student in engineering education based in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry and the Truth Institute of Leadership Education and Engineering at the University of Toronto, Canada. Her research interests include engineering culture and identity, engineering careers in the public sector, and ethics, equity, and social justice in STEM. Dimpo received a Bachelor of Applied Science in Industrial Engineering from the University of Toronto, and a Master of Science in Management, specializing in operations management from the University of Bath, United Kingdom. She has worked as a project manager in process engineering at a prominent Canadian financial institute and prior to commencing her PhD, she worked as a senior implementation analyst in cancer services in the provincial government of Ontario. Her career vision is to be a driving force for efforts to diversify engineering and challenge some of the dominant ways of thinking that might restrict diverse engineers with different viewpoints and varying career path interests. Thank you. And on that note, we would like to ask our first question to our lovely panelists and thank you all for being here. We're so grateful. Our first question is, please may you introduce yourselves and tell us one thing, one interesting thing that we may not know about you. We have listed so many wonderful things in your bio. We just want to know one little extra little simple thing. I'll start with Simple. Okay, hi everyone. And thank you for having me here. It's uh, really so wonderful to see so many familiar uh, faces and names as well. Um, uh, so I guess an interesting thing about me um, hmm, is that uh, I've always loved to dance. I sort of have done different forms of dance from when I was a kid um, through Waterford and even now I, I think I took a, a bit of a gap in my dancing but I'm sort of coming back to it through the pandemic. Thank you. Next panelist. I could go ahead. Um, hey everybody. It's so weird hearing yourself introduced even though you write your own bio. Um, I would say that the, uh, one interesting thing about me uh, I'll stay on the topic of dance. Uh, I once danced for a, a sitting president. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know it's kind of weird. It was the president of Ghana, happened in college. It was really uh, bizarre actually, well, but it was a good experience. <laughs> the 
Zanele. Good evening, everyone. Um, so um, one interesting thing about me that you might not know is that I am a mother of two uh, beautiful girls. And uh, the youngest one is right at the door trying to get in where I am right now. But it's bath time. So that's, that's an interesting fact. I couldn't stick to the dance theme because uh, I can't dance. <laughs> So as you can see for, from your bios, you're all very talented and successful people. So our next question would be, could you tell us what inspired you to pursue your career path? Anyone can go first. I could go first this time. Um, so I think that for me, uh, my career path in global development definitely started at WK, um, probably like in between Mrs. Donko and um, Mrs. Earnshaw's history classes, where we talked about African history, and then uh, my economic classes with Cece, I want to say. And um, yeah, just, I think through reading more African history, I, I became cognizant of the fact that like, you know, there's a process to development and uh, their interruptions in, in that development for many African countries due to colonialism um, and then due to bad leadership. And um, as I was reading the history, I could also see, you know, thanks to WK and its dedication to community service, the fact that a lot of us had unearned privilege. So what's the difference between me at WK and somebody um, that we're helping in our community service, it's really a question of like which family you were born into or what place you were born into and not so much to do with, you know, your capacity to succeed at all. Um, and, and I think just realizing that made me curious and econ gave me a language uh, to explore multiple questions related to poverty and inequality. And pretty much by the time I graduated IB, I knew that this is what I wanted to do and I never look back. <laughs> so. okay, um, maybe I'll go next. Uh, so uh, for me, um, I mean, I, I think in many ways what, what Ola said uh, resonate with me as well. Um, I think there were aspects of um, the way that I viewed the world and um, the sort of differential impacts that our current societies are having on, on different people um, from uh, my time at WK, but even from kind of growing up in South Africa. Um, and I really loved math and um, Mr. Alexander uh, was also one of my math teachers and really kind of enjoyed my time uh, with that. And so when I actually did uh, finished IB in Canada, um, I did do a uh, higher level physics and chemistry and um, started out in higher level math, but ended up uh, dropping to standard level. Um, but I, I knew that I wanted to continue kind of doing those things and finding a way to kind of align my values and my worldview with um, those aspects. So it was one of my um, physics teachers that sort of suggested that I, I look at engineering and I had no idea what engineering was about at that time. And um, what I started to understand initially was that really engineers kind of build things. Um, so we know, of course, about buildings and cars and um, products. Um, but as I started to learn more and uh, kind of ventured more into industrial engineering, I started to understand that there were also these sort of invisible things that engineers build, um, like different kinds of systems and processes. Um, could be anything from like logistics to websites to actual processes and organizations. And um, so I started to see there that there was some opportunity for um, really aligning those values and particularly again in the public sector, although um, that's sort of where I'm, I'm still trying to um, make that kind of come together for me because uh, I think even in engineering because of the, the kind of dominant ways of thinking in engineering, I think even engineers don't necessarily see how some of these skills could be applied in the public sector. And I think the public sector still doesn't necessarily understand how engineering skills can be kind of implemented here. But I think, especially with COVID, we're starting to understand where a lot of gaps exist um, at times in the public sector, where I think engineers could help fill uh, some of those.
Okay, thank you very much. So I think for me, I haven't always been um, in the uh, social development and community development sector. I started off in law school. Uh, so it was, it was kind of like I had to go to university and my first option was psychology, obviously. And um, I couldn't go to a South African university because the local universities did not offer any psychology or any sociology courses, but I really knew I wanted to do that. Started off at WK, of course, with community service, just um, because our community service was different. It was done with Dolores and we would go to care points around the country. And that's where my eyes actually opened about people around Eswatini because I was always a Mbabane girl and in the city, I did not know what rural life felt like, et cetera. So um, I wanted to do community development, but then I got into law school. Um, I, it wasn't very successful, but my failures actually pointed me in the right direction and I was able to move on to my passion, building the community and understanding people better and their thought processes around decision-making and also advocating for women's rights because I've been in a lot of spaces where women's rights have been violated or women have been suppressed. So that's how I started, thank you. Thank you, um, Zanele. I can definitely relate to being a Babane girl. And I think that's one thing I actually do face right now. I'm quite the Mbabane girl and you know, the rural areas are not my forte, but we're getting there. Um, the next question is, what have been some of you, the challenges you've faced in your line of work and how have you overcome these? So I believe anyone can start. I think I can just go first because I've already uh, started talking about challenges. So right now I'm the national director for uh, women in law in Southern Africa. And uh, some of the challenges that are faced um, right now is that even within civil society, you have quite a male presence and a dominance. And it, it kind of like does feel as though you have to be able, you, you need to follow suit what everybody else is doing within civil society in Eswatini. So when you come uh, with structures and a system in place, it feels like you're kind of weird. I got into the organization in a difficult time, in a transitional time of the organization, and it hasn't really been pleasant. I think um, putting in systems and having people question uh, why you want to do things differently because you have a different belief system than, than everyone else in the same space. So I think that's, that's part of my challenges that I have gone through and persevered through. Um. Um, I might just uh, follow up on that, actually, because um, the biggest challenges I found um, are what is sort of termed as a hostile climate in engineering. Um, and that is largely, um, especially, I guess, in the North American context, um, by the fact that um, it is quite a sort of white male, straight, dominated kind of paradigm in engineering. And um, uh, so part of that does sort of mean that when diverse groups are coming into engineering, there is this idea that we're sort of adopting that way of thinking and, and doing things in that way. And um, when I've tried to sort of bring up ideas around social justice or equity, um, um, sort of that scene as political and engineers like to see themselves as not political. Um, so you kind of end up having this um, clashing, but of course, things that they do and, and stances that they take do end up being political in some way. Um, so in, in some ways, that's why I have kind of come back to uh, engineering education to um, try to understand more about the culture, um, because it has been clear that even as we're kind of increasing diversity in engineering, um, people still don't necessarily stay. Um, so, so we're still seeing um, attrition rates, uh, high attrition rates when it comes to post-graduation or within the workforce and at different kind of transition points in, in people's careers. And um, uh, so 
I, I'm hoping to kind of get a better understanding of what is this culture that we're finding ourselves in and then how can we start to kind of break some of um, the dominant ways of thinking down so that we're starting to um, uh, open up and accept these kind of diverse ways of thinking and, and different ways of doing things. Yes, um, being in male dominated spaces is definitely uh, one of the challenges I've encountered. I think international development, it can be a diverse space in terms of gender. Um, in fact, you tend to find, you know, lots of women at uh, entry level and mid, and mid level, uh, less black women, but you know, uh, we're there. <laughs> and then at the top, it's very, you know, it's usually white and male and straight. Um, but I think, to, to be honest, that I've been insulated from a lot of that by my proximity to whiteness, by my proximity to, to power in terms of um, representing funders or representing partners that are well respected. Um, so I think a lot of my challenges have been, you know, more about getting, being comfortable in those spaces, being comfortable in, uh, ha being the youngest person in the room, usually, um, being the only woman in the room, usually, especially when my work is stakeholder engagement and I'm, you know, sitting with government officials and I'm just, you know, they, I, I used to think to myself, I could see in their eyes that they were just like, who is this little girl? You know, there I am in, at 22 um, and they're wondering what I could possibly say to them that they need to listen to. So I think learning how to um, take up space was was hard um, and learning to just kind of trust my own decision making um, was hard. But I think I had really great supervisors who always pushed me to go out of my comfort zone and gave me a lot more responsibility than they probably should have. And so I think um, that helped a lot to develop my confidence, yeah. Thank you very much for all of your answers. The next question is, have you experienced gender discrimination, whether directly or indirectly? If so, could you share these with us? Anyone can go first. Yeah, I think I'll go first because um, I'm basically a, a female feminist, women activist and women's rights uh, advocate. So just this week, I believe, I think it was on Monday or yesterday, just this week, I had a TV interview in the morning with the morning breakfast show. And <laughs> so I am double barreled. The state allows me to be double barreled, double barreled, and I choose to be double barreled because there's not so many women uh, who actually have the information that they don't need to take one surname. They can actually display both. I know a lot of feminists just just um, prefer to use their own surname forever, but I I felt like I just need the distinction and my husband was okay with it, whatever I choose. So I was like, you know what, let me just push and challenge the system. So I, I'm at this TV interview and the producer asks me, um, which surname do you prefer for us to put on the screen? I'm like, both. I did give you my surname. And they're like, no, we can only put one. I'm like, why? It's like, because the manager says, we can only display one, it's a matter of space. I'm like, there's a lot of space if you want to make it, you know, for me. It's because your manager is male and he will never have to take up anybody else's surname. That's why he would prefer I chose one. So if you're not writing a surname, just write my name only and that's it. So they were so perplexed by this because usually they just tell a female, which one do you prefer? And that's it, that's, that's what's going up on the tally. And I feel like that is gender discrimination because now, because I'm a woman, I'm a female that's married, I have to choose which surname. So I told them I'm choosing, I'm choosing to challenge their system so that they change to make way for women who choose to be double-barreled to use both their surnames and display them on the screen. I love that story. Um, so again, I think I've been largely protected from many direct uh, 
discriminatory actions. I think really it's, you know, it's just that initial underestimation that people have of you. Um, but I think in, in the, in some of the places I've, I've worked in, like, uh, engaged with rather, so I'm not speaking on behalf of employers, just making that clear. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've seen things like women are always the ones, it's always the, the, the female staff that are asked to go and make tea for people or asked to clean up or asked to go and get food for people. Um, you know, men all of a sudden don't have hands and can't contribute in those, in those ways. Um, a lot of the time. And, um, and then also, I think something I have experienced, and I've seen other uh, people experience is, you know, you always get these questions about, oh, so are you married? Do you have a boyfriend? So I actually, when I was working, when I started working and traveling quite a lot, um, I had a, a travel ring that I would wear because I just, I just didn't want those questions. Like, why? Why are you asking me in the middle of our meeting <laughs> whether I'm married? Like, are you going to ask my male colleague? You know, um, so it's, you know, I think there's, there's, there's like the small ways in which people remind you that you're a woman. It's, it's not the, for me, it hasn't been the big things, right, yet. Um, but it's, it's just those tiny ways that people try to put you in a particular place um, that I think I've noticed, um, if not with myself, definitely with other people who haven't, who didn't, you know, benefit from the same privilege of proximity to whiteness or power that I did. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, definitely most of what I've seen or experienced has been sort of subtle um, uh, and, I would say a lot of it also somewhat indirect, but um, uh, there have been, for example, um, comments shared in classes. Um, fortunately, I was in a program that was about 50% women. So um, I didn't experience too much um, there, but I, I knew of other uh, disciplines like electrical engineering or mineral engineering, uh, where there really were fewer women, that um, a lot more hostility was sort of experienced there. Um, there have been things like a friend bringing in kind of semi-nude um, photos of women to kind of share in the classroom. Um, uh, there have been like derogatory comments that I've heard about some of our uh, female professors. Um, and also, you know, the fact that there are no black professors. So um, uh, uh, there also have been in the workplace um, some scenarios where I, I've been very fortunate as well that I've sort of been um, personally kind of protected from um, uh, overt kind of uh, forms of discrimination. But um, even one of my more supportive managers um, used to kind of have this um, thing where he would kind of expect the female uh, staff on his team to be kind of helping him keep track of his calendar and scheduling and emails because that was the kind of stuff he didn't like to do. Um, so uh, yeah, I definitely think um, uh, this sort of exists. There, there was also uh, one um, female colleague of mine who um, you know, was really fortunate to have this supportive manager who allowed her to work four days a week um, uh, because that enabled her to sort of manage her uh, work-life balance. Um, but she found that that started uh, becoming a barrier for her when she was trying to kind of move up in the organization and um, people were expecting her to take on five days a week if she wanted to sort of move into a more senior position, despite the fact that she was able to complete pretty much the same amount of work as everyone else in the four days that she worked. Um, so I think, um, yeah, there certainly is quite a, a bit of discrimination that is still going on. And fortunately, again, I've um, not had to experience too much of it directly, but you, you still feel the sub subtle forms around as well. Thank you so much for sharing. The next question is, what are the examples of times where either professionally or socially, you felt the space you were in got gender equality right? Yeah, so um, I think I, I sort of mentioned that example of um, 
allowing some form of flexibility for um, women's individual situations. Um, and I, I thought that was a great example of um, being able to kind of accommodate um, the, the needs of um, uh, that particular woman. Um, I've also seen some examples, I think, from like um, university student groups where um, there really is a focus, especially when doing teamwork, because that often can be where you feel um, some of that discrimination, um, where there really is an emphasis and a focus on getting to know each other and really trying to understand each other and work together based on our different skills and abilities. And I found that that kind of um, conscious approach to bringing teams together actually helps to overcome some of those biases and misconceptions that people might have about each other. Um, uh, I've also really been fortunate to work uh, in the public sector where um, there really are a lot of benefits for women. So I, I worked in uh, the cancer service organization that had almost 70% women, which on the other end of things, I also thought was a little imbalanced. But um, at the same time, because of the amount of women that were in that organization, there was so much um, support provided to women in terms of ensuring that they had um, adequate pay, um, ensuring that uh, they had adequate maternity leave. So it could be 12 to 18 month maternity leave, um, ensuring there were enough vacation days and sick days. Um, and so I think um, those are, are some really great examples of, of sort of trying to um, even out the playing field. And, and certainly there were never any questions around um, you know, getting a promotion and are you close to having a child or anything like that? It was just, um, you know, recognize that people are having children and, and that's completely a part of life, but it would never sort of impede on someone's ability to progress. Uh, I would say that my time in Rwanda, you know, I saw a lot of promising things. Um, so that was really the first country that I worked in. Um, and there were women in leadership positions, you know, at every level. So from the, you know, microfinance institution that we were working with to the government ministry that we were working with, there were, there were women, there was women who were leading and not just in a representational sense, but like really the ones who were in charge of making decisions, um, and the ones with influence. And so I think Rwanda is definitely doing something right <laughs> um, in terms of that, because I see it in business, I see it in the public sector, um, just across board, whether or not that actually translates to um, like the everyday person. I think it helps because it, I, think, I think there is a sense that women can and should be respected and can rise to levels of leadership. But I think a lot of the work that I've seen that we probably have to do is about just everyday gender norms amongst people. So, yeah. So true. I think uh, my example will be a personal one. When I was um, having my second baby, I changed jobs from uh, Medicine Sans Frontiers in Sangano because it was just too far for me to travel. And the project, I was a qualitative research officer was ending. So I got a new job with the same institution I'm with now at Women in Law. And I joined them in September and I was going to give birth in November. And I got fully paid three months maternity leave. So I was like, wow, this institution is like the best, especially because the law does not recognize matern fully paid maternity leave in, a, in Eswatini. And it's very, you know, um, it's basically up to your employer and um, it gives women like six weeks maternity leave fully paid and then everything else has to be deducted in, in the discretion of the employee of the employer on what they actually decide to to do so that's that's a very personal experience and actually um, it gave me a lot of hope that women in Eswatini can actually be looked after and you know we can advocate while we're experiencing a more gender equal work environment. Thank you so much for your answers. The next question is, 
What role do you think women can play in challenging norms in the workplace within society? I think the best place to start is women need to be in support in support of each other and we also need to start being conscious of what we say when we are speaking amongst people just the general public and people in general because one thing that I have heard um and when we have meetings that women working together, like women will always show up and repeat this pull her down syndrome, whatever thing that has is like decades old. I do not think it exists anymore in our society, but because we keep on repeating it and we keep on saying it. So I think the first thing that women can do is changing the language and changing the narrative and then acting according to that change by being your sister's keeper in the workplace. Because um, sometimes people unconsciously put people under the bus and it's usually women. Um, and it then feels as though women are not supportive of each other and that narrative kind of keeps on going, you know? So I think we just need to be more conscious about what we say and mean exactly what we say and try to be our sister, our sister's keepers. Um, yeah, I, I think that women play a role in just occupying the space or so the position. Um, so I think of um, NOI, um, Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, who just um, became the DG of the World Trade Organization. You know, it it's not a particularly uh, powerful role if like you know how the world systems work it's kind of but she but it means something right for someone that looks like her um um and that is so you know bold and loud about her africanness about her about her womanness like to occupy that space so it's it's a it's a there's role modeling that happens right it's a signal to those of us who are you know further down or, for, or earlier in our careers that look there is the the extent of possibilities even wider now right um but it can't just end at representation there actually has to be influence um and women in workplaces actually have to be given um you know real work real roles <laughs> um and taken seriously and then i think the other role that women have is to call out to call out when things are tone deaf or when things are mis misog like any misogynist assumptions right we're all guilty of having bias biases and i think that you know if you put a room full of white men together they're going to come up with a version of the world that looks very different from one of where you have a more diverse group of you know maybe some black women some hispanic women some lesbian women you know like it's it's like the diversity helps you to see um different dimensions of things and especially in in the work that i do which is a lot to do with designing and implementing programs thinking about you know, what does what does participating in this program look like for a woman or a young girl? You know, is is this a space that they can enter? Is this something that they can take time out to do? Because we have to remember that women are looked to for so much unpaid labor in the home. So is she gonna have time to go to that particular place to fetch water and then also get to your program to collect her um her medication or her cash transfer or whatever the the thing is right so um i think women women's perspectives are also um the value that they bring in in workplaces um yeah and and just challenging challenging assumptions about what women can do um expectations on them right so like you the either or paradigm of you either have to be a mother docile and at home or you care about your career right like when you have women like Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala I didn't even know that woman had a husband and four children so like kudos to her for having it all <laughs> and being the Beyonce of international development uh and economics like so I think I think people um yeah I think I think there's a lot of value that women bring to the work to the workplace and that's just a few of them. Thanks. 
Yeah, I think I echo um, what Sonal and Ola have said. Um, uh, I think one other important part that I've sort of found in this as well, um, sometimes somewhat related to this idea of imposter syndrome, I think what Ola was also kind of referring to is just trying to feel comfortable in these spaces. Um, but also I think part of that, um, I recently actually read an article saying we should stop this idea of imposter syndrome in the sense that that again then seems to indicate that there's some sort of issue with women where the issue really is with the system that we're in. Um, so I think even when trying to kind of challenge some of these systems, sometimes there can be really bad backlash and, and it can be really hurtful and can lead to a, somewhat of a traumatic experience. So I, I think it's also really important for women um, again, to find ways to support each other, to find a group of women within your organization that you really um, feel, you know, will support you in, in whatever challenges you might be kind of trying to um, uh, bring forward. Um, and then uh, self-care uh, through that process as well and, and kind of making sure, again, that you're always thinking about the ways that the system might be working um, and not, you know, leading to more and more kind of self-doubt uh, about yourself. Um, and I think in that way, um, having representation also can really, really help because it, it shows you that um, it is possible. But um, again, I think you, you need to have that sort of good sense of um, uh, what you're feeling comfortable with and knowing where you, you might be kind of um, reaching your bounds so that you, you don't push yourself too far either. Um, but overall, I would say, yeah, like advocating for better measures that support all women. Um, I mentioned a few with like maternity leave, flexible hours, childcare, decent wage. Um, and I think transparent salaries is one we not really seeing, but is a very important one for us to start seeing more of so that we can see if there are any um, disparities in, in salaries. Um, and then definitely, I think this, this recognition of intersectionality is so important as well, because um, it really, again, these, these disparities and, and the way that they affect you is not the same for all women either. Um, and so really kind of uh, trying to support each other in, um, uh, in kind of dealing with these differences that we might be experiencing is, is important as well. Thank you so much. We would like to remind the audience that the chat option is open. Please do drop any questions, comments. We are eager to know what's on your mind. And moving on to the next question. Do you think men have a role to play? If yes, what role do you think they can play? I can speak here first. Um, men definitely have a role to play because often they're the ones sitting with the power. Um, and so their their allyship matters a lot. And I have to say that I am definitely somebody that has benefited from male mentors. I think by virtue of being in economics originally, it was almost a given that my mentors were male. Um, but because of that, I think they, they've sort of conferred their credibility to me, right? Or like their legitimacy to me when they introduced me to, to places or recommend me, sorry, recommend me to, to uh, roles. Um, so I think that's definitely one role that men can play, you know, take on a mentee that's, uh, that's a woman, that's a young woman. And I know in the era of me too, like people say, oh, but then do they have to be extra careful? Like, you know, don't, don't be a nonsense, um, like <laughs> act correct <laughs> and don't do anything you wouldn't do to your male mentees, right? And and you'll be fine. Um, so I think so I think I, I, I kind of bristle at those fears. Um, I think most men are capable of not being uh, predators. And, and so at least I'd like to hope so. Um, and so I, I don't I think that's a null argument. I think that um, that mentorship is is one of the ways that men can be vocal. I think sharing their salary information as well, as Dimpo was saying, um, because the pay, the gender pay gap is real. It is very real. Um, and it is especially real if you're a, a woman of color. Um, so I think that when, when you know how much your male <laughs> colleagues earn, it's a really good way of uh, going to HR and being like, hi, 
I noticed that Mark and I have the same job. We've got the same degree, literally graduated from the same program. Why is he earning, you know, 8% or 20% more? Um, yeah, because these are the kind of conversations you're going to need, like we all are going to need to have. Um, and I've had friends do that, literally take their male colleagues um, contracts and put their contract. I've even had a, 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 a woman economist that I look up to so much tell me how when she went to go interview for a, a really you know, senior role in a well-known international organization, when she asked her, her male friend who was also um, being interviewed what he was offered, it was like way more than hers. And she's like a name in the field. So this is something that doesn't go away even as you rise and, and, and gain prominence. So I think that uh, men, please tell us what you're earning, you know, do us a favor. <laughs> and yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I also definitely have had very um, many male uh, mentors and sponsors, and I think it's very important for men to um, take up that role. Um, uh, a lot of it has been because they've sort of seen my potential, so they, they really are kind of trying to bring that out um, in me, and I think that really is so important. Um, uh, I also, again, there's this sort of idea, again, that, you know, with some of these discriminatory systems that it's the people who are uh, feeling them that are kind of trying to fight the most against them and often we're doing that also in voluntary ways <laughs> so using up our free time to do that which also then impacts you know how far you are kind of progressing in your career because you're focusing on all these other things um, and so I think in those ways it's also really important for men to get involved in challenging these systems as allies. Um, I also would say, you know, again, in the same way that racism is not an, a people of color issue, it's an everyone issue. Um, and, and so, you know, white people should be involved in trying to address racism as well, in the same way men should be involved in trying to address um, gender discrimination, for sure. Okay, so I think men can play a huge role. Um, I know that um, we're probably in different places, different worlds even, because in Eswatini, um, the male role is, is, is not as simple. It includes um, salary transparency, because there is the gender pay gap is also quite much in Eswatini. I'm an executive director, but I'm, pretty sure I earn much more less than all the other executive male directors. Um, but I also think that men in our context just need to speak up, uh, speak up about issues that women are going through and be the ones to bring out these issues. I'll make an example that in our parliament system, we only have like two women that were voted in. We have four women that were selected from the different regions to meet the minimum, which they don't meet 30% of women that are supposed to be in parliament. So we need men stepping up and actually point, pointing this out that we do not have enough women to discuss issues instead of also taking part in um, like uh, suppressing women or oppressing them from speaking out. Men also need to get rid of their, um, um, what do I call it? It's, it's, it's kind of like their entitlement over women's bodies. Like, I mean, like I grew up in an environment where WK, anyone can wear whatever they want to wear, but then get out to the world, like the world meaning Eswatini, just Eswatini, uh, you know, and you're like, people cannot dress in whatever they're comfortable in. And that's what the, that's the role that men need to take. They need to stop feeling entitled over women's bodies. Like if, if that can stop, I think the entitlement in our context starts with when boy children are allowed to pee on the side of the street and men are actually facing the other direction, peeing while you're driving. And I'm like, really? I think that's a sense of entitlement. I can actually go to the toilet anywhere and anytime I want because I have a penis. So I don't think, I think that's where it starts. Like just 
it needs to go. It needs to stop. And men have to also be part of the conversation. They need to start speaking up. We're grateful that we have men's organizations right now that are mentoring men to actually try and make them see how privileged they are, they are in a society. Because if I would stop on the side of the street and pull down my panties and pee, it would just be like, wow, okay. You know what, just you've done such a huge crime, but these men all over, like sometimes I will actually count how many men I see peeing on the side of the road, just driving from Babani to Manzini each and every day. And it's just huge amount. So sense of entitlement and speaking up. So men do have a major role to play right now because the scales are not balanced at all and they have to come out to speak for women as well. Thank you to all our panelists. You brought up really important points. Um, so now we're opening the floor to questions. So if you do have a question, you can unmute and just ask. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much to our panelists and just for this discussion. It's been very constructive. Um, I had a question about um, well, you're all very like inspiring women, very well versed in your various careers. And I was just, okay, I'm trying to find a good way to phrase it, but do you think that in a society where women such as yourselves are very empowered and women empowerment is promoted, do you think that the society perhaps um, shuns women who prefer to act in more traditional roles maybe I can say like give an example that like there are women out there who are very much empowered very much self-actualized who very much prefer to just be mothers and that's what they feel they're I don't know like they want to do with their lives like just to you know stay at home be mothers to their children and that's where they feel the most self-actualized do you think that um there perhaps isn't room for them or is that a bad thing yeah that's kind of my question Uh, thanks for your question, Tianza. I don't know if anybody else wants to take this, but um, I think this is, I think that one thing society likes to do is pit women against each other. Um, and so we say we're feminists because we want rights. <laughs> now there must be two sides, <laughs> you know, there's the ones who are just happy with the way things are is how it's framed, right? The ones who want to stay at home. And then there's those of us that are creating trouble by wanting things. And um, I think that dichotomy is very false. I think um, at least the, the feminism that I subscribe to is women's rights to choices and to equal opportunity. So if if being a stay-at-home mom is what you want good like if, if it's really what you want if if you have been exposed to the multiple options that you can have right and you decide that that's the one that you want then good for you you know there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that or lesser than if anything you know like like i said women's unpaid labor the domestic labor that women do just goes uncounted um, and uncompensated so I have a lot of respect for people who uh, child to do childcare. I'm not planning to have children, um, so I, you know, so kudos to the rest of you. Um, I think that, I think that, yeah, we have to we have to unsubscribe from these false narratives that you can you have to be one or the other. Um, it really is. I don't want to say it's, it's just about choice because it's it's not. It's but it's about conscious, informed decision making, right? So um, are you operating as a woman from a place of agency where um, where you you have access to different options and then choose that one? Or are you operating from a place of scarcity where you were given two options and that's it? And so you pick the lesser of two evils or whatever, right? So I think that's, that's, that's the more important question. Um, so yeah, thank you. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with what you're saying because women are not a homogeneous group. We don't all want the same thing. Um, I have children, I am a career woman and I've never wanted to stay. I, actually, I've never been able to stay home. <laughs> Even when I was jobless for like five months, I 
build up a network of women meeting. <laughs> so, you know, like I've never ever wanted to stay home, but I know women who want to stay home and who actually do have conversations like women working together who come and have conversations with us because um, like we've, we've discussed earlier on that being a mom is also an unpaid job and it is a full time job like it is like full time. So um, I don't think women's rights or the women's movement or feminism uh, shuns against women. And as we saw in the video before this intersectional uh, feminism that comes together to say, we all have options and we should kind of move forward together and looking at the array of options that we have as women. Yeah, I completely agree with that, what everyone has said. I think really the aim of um, at least the feminism I also ascribe to is about understanding and recognizing that there are different needs and wants um, of women and supporting all women based on, on what those are um, and finding ways to do that. So for sure, I, I think you both said it really well. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think Nokwanda had her hand raised. And after Nokwanda, I think we can take one more question because of time. Um, Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to ask the three lovely ladies about International Women's Day because I was just thinking to myself on Monday evening after all the corporates had, you know, put up their nicely branded posts and everything. You know, what 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 do you think about International Women's Day as a, you know, this one day every year where we bring up these important conversations? But also, you know, what are the like tangible outcomes? And especially with each year has a theme, this year it's choose to challenge. You know, what are we challenging? What's the actual output in terms of, you know, things? So just yeah, what do you think of International Women's Day as a concept and then the the outcomes of it? Okay, I think that for Eswatini, especially because that's the context in which I'm operating under, International Women's Day um, brings up like an opportunity for us to actually, you know, uh, put a spotlight on what women are doing uh, and where women are shining in the country. And, but also with this year's theme, we chose to challenge the state to actually um, consider uh, gender-based violence as a national emergency. We've seen just today at 12 noon, a police officer, a senior police officer shot at his baby mama after, using, uh, after losing a maintenance trial. At a court, a magistrate court, he actually took out his uh, weapon, which he signed up for and made an oath to use against criminals, against whoever was in the wrong and shot at his, the mother of his child. So we, we thought let's choose to challenge the system to, it, it's about time because we've, we've seen that we have these technical working groups, we have um, these little committees that really don't come up with results. But if um, any, any sort of issue is made a national emergency, you need to have a strategy and you need to actually measure all of the, the the outputs of that strategy that you have in place, and it's for a time frame you deal with such issues. So that's what, as a civil society, we're choosing to challenge. Because I, I, um, my organization sits at the as the gender consortium chair under uh, the coordinating umbrella body for civil society. So that's what we're challenging. And when it comes to the outputs, I know that. Most of the time, it's more on the celebration part. So you can measure how much we've celebrated women and which women are where and what they have done, their success stories, et cetera. Uh, but it is about time we actually challenged more and we, we gave more um, into measuring what exactly we've attained on this, on this day. But we're fortunate enough that the U.S. has made it a Women's History Month. Uh, because it all started in the United States. So we 
we're glad to follow suit and make it the whole of March so that we're able to extend whatever advocacy uh, we are doing around women's issues. Yeah, I'll um, kind of echo, I, I think I've always kind of had this struggle because uh, here in Canada, we've also just kind of come through um, Black History Month and always had this challenge with why is it like a day or a month that we're kind of focusing on a particular issue that affects people every single day. Um, on one hand, I, I definitely think it is important to consciously have these moments where we can have these discussions and, and conversations. Um, uh, but at the same time, for me, it really is about doing this work every single day and making sure that these conversations don't stop when this day or this month um, passes. Um, and I think what I've noticed, um, I, at least again from North American perspective, is with these sorts of days um, or months that um, it has tended to be a moment of celebration. And so those conversations do kind of stop after that point. Um, and so even though, for example, in engineering, equity, diversity, and inclusion work has kind of been going on for almost 50 years, there's really been very little progress um, seen over time. And again, I, I still attribute that in some ways to the culture and the ways that we're thinking about diversity and representation, that it is sort of this idea that we're all coming into what already exists and somehow supposed to um, assimilate into that. Um, and I, I do think that, um, and for me, this is what I'm choosing to challenge is, again, these dominant ways of thinking um, that are basically perpetuating that. Um, and so I, I do think that it is about kind of getting to the actual cultures that are continuing to perpetuate these um, systems of oppression that um, that need to be challenged in order for us to start to recognize that these kind of issues are occurring every single day um, and trying to understand ways that we can start to shift um, shift these systems and these cultures um, on a daily sort of basis. One, one way in particular is again because you know, task forces and committees have really been set up almost everywhere now. Um, but you are, in some cases, also seeing that they're sort of on the periphery. Um, and often, you know, CEOs or um, the central decision makers um, aren't as closely connected to those boards or those committees or um, aren't, are sort of looking at them as um, uh, informational kind of bodies, but not actually implementation. Uh, oriented bodies. And, and so again, in terms of shifting our culture and really recognizing that these issues are integral to everything that we're doing in every organization, um, we'll hopefully start to move away from seeing these issues as kind of periphery or once a month, once a day, uh, a year to something that is ingrained in our being every single day of, of every year. Hopefully, that's that's what I hope to see. Yep. yep, that's the dream. Um, that's def yeah, that's the goal. Because uh, I think, I think a lot of these days become branding exercises for, for companies like, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's Pride Month. Okay, we're gonna be rainbow. Oh, it's Black History Month. We're gonna be black. It's Women's Month. We're gonna be purple, <laughs> you know, and, um, but I think some things that we can I, so I think we should choose to challenge that, right? Like show your working as you would in math, right? Like don't just give us the nice product outward, you know, <laughs> um, but like show us your working, release your list of uh, stakeholder of, um, sorry, what, what is this thing called? Board members, right? Let's see how many women are on your board. Let's see how many women are in upper management. Let's see, you know, how many black people are in your entry level. Um, do you put your money where your mouth is when you have events outside of this month are your panels you know mantles are they just all male or do you try to have some color some some gender you know uh, representation or diversity right um so i think i think that's what we should choose to challenge i think the the branding is nice and it's cute and make it makes us feel good but we need to see real movement and i think we need to be bold and in, in in challenging our organizations to 
to um, release those statistics and to ask those questions so that they can, you know, face the numbers <laughs> and 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 know that there's work to be done. So, yeah. Thank you so, so much. And in closing, we would like to give you all one minute to just say any final comments, but just to inject a little question there. My last question is, what is one thing that we can do at an individual level to make a positive impact on gender equality at our organization? I can just quickly go okay. oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. It's okay. Um, thank you very much for having me on this panel and with the two lovely ladies. Nice to meet you. Um, I think what what you can do in each organization is just um, what Ola has said, that you just need to be conscious of the women within the organization and involving women within the organization. And I love what she said about conscious program development for women and whether they'll actually have the time to do all of what you're asking for within your program or your project or whatever it is you're doing. So I think each organization needs to go in and uh, look at that. Thank you very much and have a good night to everyone. Thanks, Amelia. It was so nice meeting you as well. Um, I think my uh, final thing to round up would be, you know, lift as you climb. Um, what if it sets you up for great privilege? Um, you get to go to a great college or, and often that means you get a good education. And so you get opportunities that people who look like you or come from the background that you do might not always have access to. And what do you do once you're there? You know, like once I think always leaving the door open, um, one thing I really enjoy doing is I won't say mentoring because I'm quite an early career professional, right? So I don't think I can be quite mentoring anybody yet, but I'm always open. I always avail myself for, to conversations to younger people, younger women, especially, right? Um, who are curious about the trajectory I took or who just have questions that I had at that age, right? Um, so I think, yeah, lift, uh, yeah, lift as you climb, you know, recommend other women for, for roles. Um, you know, if even if you can't take a job, tell your, your other friend to come take this job instead, right? So um, those are some of the things I think we can do. Thank you. And thank you for having us, for having me and us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, kind of hard to go last. <laughs> I think those are great points. Um, thank you so much uh, to everyone. Really, this was an amazing discussion and it was so nice to meet you, Zanella, and to see you, Ola, and um, others here. Um, I think uh, for me, yeah, consciousness really is, is where at the heart of it, um, especially on an individual level, I think um, just really kind of being aware of um, your own biases, but also where they might have come from and kind of the, the systems and the culture and the context that you're operating within. Um, and part of that also um, kind of involves um, respecting yourself in a way in in recognizing that that's where you've come from and, and that that's what brought you to where you are. Um, but also I think in doing that, it helps you respect um, and acknowledge the differences in the other women around you as well. And, and then helping to support them in what it is that they would like to achieve. Um, uh, I definitely am a strong believer as well in, in continuing to have discussions with others who are interested in um, my career path or um, uh, just sharing the knowledge that I've learned uh, over the time uh, that I've kind of been in my career. Um, and I definitely try as much as possible. Um, there's this idea of, you know, having, bringing in someone um, uh, like another woman or another woman of color uh, in your organization in the time that you're there. So whether it's re uh, recommending them for uh, a job that they might be applying to or, um, uh, you know, uh, letting them know that a job opening might be available if they're interested. Um, all those sorts of um, individual acts, I think, are really important um, and and relatively easy for us to do. So, yeah. And thank you so much again. This was amazing.
All right, um, we have one final question and I believe Eileen will ask it. Um, I know we said final question, but a question came through, so I'm really, yeah. So, but before that, I'm going to say a quote by our principal, Ms. Patricia Angoy. Women and girls hold up more than half the world. I send our women and girls my admiration and give strength to all that they achieve and dream for our present and future. Okay, so the question is, and one person can answer this question. What do you think is the role of religion in the oppression of women? And do you think that there is a way of working around the oppression while still respecting the religion? So I actually typed an answer to Jason because I saw the question went unanswered. Um, but I'll just review what I said to him. Um, yes, religion plays a huge part in it, right? Like I think, whew, sometimes I think it is the beginning of, of our problems. Um, <laughs> I say this as a as a practicing Christian, but I really do think, um, really do think that you know, um, I can. I've I've argued with a lot of Christian men about oh because we were made second. Does that make us second in life? Um, but I think I think even within religions, uh, whatever religion you may be, I think something that religions seem to have uh, share is this idea of love and. Um, sort of like justice, right? And so however the religion defines that um, often looks a lot like respect, <laughs> looks a lot like dignifying people, you know, looks a lot like listening to people, valuing people. Um, and so I think when we center those things, um, that that helps. And, and I definitely think that you can advocate for, um, for women's rights or uh, gender, you know, rights of differently gendered people uh, within religious um, structures. So actually a lot of my feminism was informed by a class I took in college that was about gender and Islam, right? Like before before I took that class, I didn't know you could be religious and feminist, right? And, and that class really opened up my eyes to the fact that like, you know, if people want to wear the hijab because that's how they, um, want to model modesty what's important is that it's their choice and it's it's happening within a framework right where that means something to them where that starts but then it's also good to have a history of of um head coverings and like where do these things come from and what's tradition and what's actually um necessary in religion right and what's the spectrum that we're looking at so i think um i think uh, to kind of sum it all up we have to have a we have to allow for questioning and we have to allow for interrogation of where the things that we th we take as given actually come from in whatever source text you ascribe that you uh, that you subscribe to <laughs> yeah thank you thank you so much to all our panelists um it was i'm really grateful that you all came and spoke it was really educating to hear what you have to say on these issues and answering our questions. Um, I'll now pass on to Owe. I cannot express my gratitude enough for being able to be given this opportunity to speak with such amazing women. And I think it's one thing I am very, very grateful for. I've picked a whole lot from today and especially one quote I'm going to use every single day that is show your working like in math. So thank you very much. I am going to inject that everywhere. And um, I just think one thing that I can sum up from this entire day is that, you know, this whole idea of gender equality is not a one man's work. It requires both people and every single person to work together and I think when we start to talk about men being entitled and especially in Eswatini it leaves me with a challenge it leaves me awakened it leaves me wanting to do so much more I am definitely going to try and take up space I am definitely going to lift as I rise and you know as I climb and we'd like to thank each and every one and for the lovely audience um, thank you for attending thank you for being here thank you for your comments we are reading them they're lovely thank you for your questions 
And we would just like to close and say, um, women, we love you so much. And men, you need to do better. And it's not just we're saying that again and again, but actually show us you're working. Thank you. Um, we will leave things open for five minutes. So if you want to just comment on anything or add anything, you can. Okay.